couldn't believe I was actually in that building. If someone had told me 10 minutes earlier that I'd be sitting at a table inside a place called the Gray Mist, I would have asked what insane asylum he or she had just escaped from. The club was on Fulton Avenue. It was owned by a friend of Satin's named Jasmine Ploy, who opened the club back in 1980 because she grew abherently weary of the discrimination she, as a black lesbian, encountered at the white gay clubs. I don't know if I found the fact that white homosexuals discriminated against black homosexuals ironic, hypocritical, or typical. I mean, I watched them march on Washington, demanding equal rights and equal treatment, then turned around and in the same breath said, I might sleep with someone of the same sex, but hey, at least I don't sleep with no niggers. Now was that ironic, hypocritical, or just plain typical of some racist, ignorant white people who just happen to be homosexuals? In all fairness, Satin said that there were some white homosexuals who were not afraid to cross the color line, but most of them did so only under very discreet circumstances. Their secretiveness was reminiscent of the slave masters and mistresses who crept out to the slave quarters in search of what Satin called a piece of ebony ecstasy. We are taboo to them, Satin said, and that makes us all the more erotic in their little racist minds but they can't afford to have their lily-white reputations tainted by having an open relationship with a black homosexual. I asked Satin if she had ever slept with anyone outside her race, and she said, No, I refuse to be anyone's dirty little secret. Somehow, I got the feeling that that statement was directed toward me as well. See, Tanya, it's just a club. Satin said, waving hello to a group of women sitting at the bar. I have heartedly agreed as I observed the scene. In most respects, the Grey Mist was just another club. The music was blaring through giant speakers that were strategically placed in every corner, pumping out the latest club jams. The overhead lights were dim so that they wouldn't interfere with the colorful disco lights whirling around the dance floor. Tables were crammed close together, making it impossible to leave your seat without disturbing the people at the neighboring tables. And of course, cigarette smoke hovered overhead, migrating down ever so often to make its irritating presence known. The gray mist was just another club, except for one thing. It was a gay club, a black gay club. Homosexuals or homos, freaks, lesbians or lesbos, butch, dykes or bull dykes or bull daggers, as I had once heard my mother refer to them, were all here, sandwiched on the small dance floor, sitting at the bar drinking, talking and laughing, and stealing intimate seconds by whispering in the ear of the person next to them. Was this the only black club in Baltimore, I wondered? Where did they all come from? Do I know any of them? though I certainly hope not. In her book, Audre Lord talked about feeling as if she were the only black lesbian on earth. Until that night, I felt as if Miyoki, Satin, and Robin were the only ones in Baltimore. I was experiencing the most extreme case of culture shock I could ever have imagined. I wasn't surprised to see two black women kiss on the lips as they greeted or by the intimacy that surrounded their mouths as they talked, or by their laughter, hand-holding, hugging, or even by their dancing across from one another. I'd seen and participated in that kind of activity before, but I was stunned to see two black women out in public, engaged in an open mouth kiss, shoving tongues down each other's throats, seemingly trying to lick each other's tonsils. And I was dazed to see two black women pressing their bodies close together as they freak to I Like the Girls by the Fat Back Band. And because of my infancy and this type of atmosphere, I couldn't help staring and thinking that I could never dance like that out in the open. How about a dance? Satin suggested after sipping her Long Island iced tea, confirming my suspicions that she had totally lost her cotton-picking mind. Go out there and dance with her? Go out there and admit to everyone that I'm that way? I turned to the dance floor. Couples were snapping their fingers and clapping or waving their hands in the air as their bodies swayed to shackles by RJ's latest arrival. 
They were all enjoying themselves, expressing openly and affectionately feelings that surprised, disconcerted, and at times disgusted me. I don't want to dance, I said, turning my attention to Satin. Fine, she said. I'll dance by myself. Satin sipped her drink, then clapped and danced her way to the floor when the DJ played House Call by Maxie Priest. I reared back in my chair and watched as a light-skinned woman eased her way onto the floor and began dancing with Satin, who rocked her body smoothly and very femininely. She was wearing a tight blue mini dress and a pair of sheer black stockings that had a vine of roses climbing up the sides of her long legs. She looked gorgeous. While I was watching Satin, a woman said, Hello, Tanya. Even before I turned around, with my mouth hanging open, I knew that Miyoki Outlaw was standing at my table.